Here we look at two key figures in the revolutionary struggle. Men who were on the same side in the 1916 Rising and the War of Independence, but who took different positions on the treaty and were on opposite sides in the Civil War. And even in the earlier period, when they're ostensibly on the same side, they were really arch enemies. They hated each other and they brought a venom, a personal venom to the conflict that shocked many of their contemporaries. One of them was Michael Collins. The other was not the person who you might think, Eamon de Valera. For many of these years, they got on well. The other person was Cahill Brua. Both would lose their lives in the, in the, war, in the, in the Civil War, uh, and both left, left a lasting shadow over Irish history in the 20th century. Collins especially so, who joined Parnell as another great lost leader. To look at Collins first, he was the man who, in Arthur Griffith's words, won the war, won the war of independence, and got much of the credit afterwards for it, much to people like Brewer's disgust. And Brewer was to deliver a vicious a speech attacking him during the treaty debates in Dáil Éireann. Uh, Collins is an intriguing figure. He was born in 1890, the year of the Parnell split. He grew up loving the stories of Robert Emmett. His party piece was reciting Emmett's great speech from the dock. And it was only natural, I suppose, that he became involved in the process of, uh, of de-anglicising uh, Ireland. He got involved in the Gaelic League, uh, the literary cultural movement. He got involved in the Gaelic Athletic Association, the sporting movement. He moved to London to work. And there he learned about administration. There he learned about bureaucracy. Because the thing about Collins, and the thing that has been kind of lost in the mythology, is that Collins's great strength was as an organiser. In popular mythology, in cinema, he's seen as the, the master revolutionary, the man with the gun in one hand. Actually, he carried a gun for, well, really not very long at all. He had a gun during the 1916 Rising, and again during the Civil War. But he never carried a gun during the War of Independence. His work was done coordinating things, organising things. He probably never fired a shot during the War of Independence. But as the mythology grew around him, uh, he suddenly became uh, this all-elusive Scarlet Pimpernel figure. And Collins played up to that. He loved, during the War of Independence, to cycle around uh, Dublin, acting like a regular person, going through British checkpoints, never being caught. They didn't know what he looked like. He became an MP. He sat at Dáil Éireann uh, from 1919 on. And occasionally they would raid the building. They would raid the Parliament to try and find Collins. One occasion, he went up onto the roof and stayed there until they went. Another time, there wasn't time to go on the roof. So he just kept sitting down, took out a cigarette, lit it and started smoking. And when they asked him if he had seen Collins, he said, oh, you know, around here somewhere. And they never found him. And all of that contributed to the mythologizing. All of that contributed to the legend. The man who took on British intelligence, the man who took on the British army, the British empire, and won. Well, he came to prominence First of all, in the 1916 Rising, so many of the leaders had to have been in the GPO or somewhere involved in 1916 to have any credibility afterwards. And he had fought in the GPO. He was an aide to Joseph Mary Plunkett and he observed the leaders close up. It's interesting that the person he really admired was the realist Connolly and not the idealist Pierce. He said that Connolly was someone he would have followed to hell and back. Pierce, he said, well, I'd have, to I'd have to think about that one. He liked, uh, he liked the attitude of Connolly. He liked the fact that Connolly understood military tactics and seemed to have a good grasp of what needed to be done. And afterwards, he was imprisoned. He was interned at Frongoch uh, in Wales. And this was the camp that he described as the University of Revolution. Because having all of the revolutionaries together was a great learning experience. They were able to discuss ideas, they were able to tell, talk about Irish history and Irish nationalism, and also they were able to make plans for the future. And uh, while he was there, he began to take a leadership position in the organisation. He began challenging 
the, the officials about food conditions, about the treatment of the prisoners, he began a ruthless campaign against one of the doctors for what he claimed was the mistreatment of the prisoners, and that doctor committed suicide. He got the nickname The Big Fellow, and that's a name that has stuck to Collins, and it's a very affectionate nickname, The Big Fellow. He was a big lad from County Cork. He loved to wrestle with his men. Uh, the night before the rebellion, before the 1916 Rising broke out, he called around to his men and he said, let's play a game of cards. Let's play for money. Tomorrow we go out to fight. And they said, great, let's deal the cards. And he said, wait a minute. I want to make sure there's no cheating. And he put his hands in his pockets, took out two revolvers and put them down on the table. And all the men said, yeah, no cheating. And they took out their revolvers and suddenly there were 15 guns on the table. That's the kind of man he was. He loved joking, he loved messing, he loved uh, 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 play fighting with the men. But at Frangoch, the name Big Fellow wasn't meant entirely affectionately. He was the big fellow who was always interfering in things, who was always insisting that things were done his way. He was the one who, who maybe was a little bit of a bully. And, and so there was a kind of a warning attached to the name as well. He was eventually released and in the period after that, uh, began to establish himself as a key figure. He became uh, the leader of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. He became the director of intelligence for the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. And so, even though the new government was formed in 1919, he, and he became Minister for Finance in that, uh, after Owen McNeill stepped down, he controlled the military operation uh, to all intents and purposes. He controlled the IRA uh, effectively, he controlled the IRB. Cahill Brewer was the Minister for Defence who was nominally in control of this entire thing and much of their animosity stems from the fact that Collins never consulted with Brewer. Collins kept him out of the loop. Collins liked to do things his way and their enmity, their hatred stems from that. Now, after the outbreak of the, of the, after the 1916 Rising, some of the prisoners in the jails went on hunger strike. A key figure was one of the great leaders, Thomas Ashe, one of the commandants in 1916. And he went on hunger strike and he died. And they asked Collins to deliver an oration at the graveside. This was an echo back to, to Pierce's famous oration at the grave of O'Donovan Rossa and Collins stood up to speak at that grave. And shots were fired by the soldiers, by the IRA, over the grave. And Collins said, nothing additional remains to be said. That volley which we have just heard is the only speech which it is proper to make above the grave of a dead Fenian. And he stepped away. Now, I don't think that was intended as a rebuke to Patrick Pierce, who had delivered a long oration at the grave of a dead Fenian. I think it wasn't looking back, it was looking forward. It was his way of saying, the time for talking is over. Now is the time for action. Now is the time for fighting. And we are not going to talk anymore until we have won our Irish Republic. And the genius of Collins, when the War of Independence did break out in 1919, the genius of Collins is that he was a brilliant organiser who was able to coordinate plans. He had spies in Dublin Castle. He was able to find out what they were planning, their raids and where they were going to go so that he was able to move his men. He was able to escape, uh, uh, rescue Eamon de Valera from Lincoln Jail in England uh, by finding out uh, uh, the shape of the key by smuggling out an imprint of the key uh, in wax and then making a, a key and smuggling it in, in a birthday cake and then having de Valera use that to get out of the prison. Ingenious stuff, brilliant stuff. And all the time, he's doing everything he can to disrupt British intelligence. He organises Bloody Sunday in 1920 where they assassinate the leaders of British intelligence, the Cairo gang, although as it later turned out, they weren't all in intelligence. They, there wasn't a so-called Cairo gang that, uh, and because and there was a nastiness to the war as well, where some people who were accountants or trying to follow the money trail or other parts of the British administration were caught in the crossfire there.
And the, and the feuding with Karl Brewer became particularly heated during this period. Uh, the Collins Legends was established, but afterwards, he, as we'll see, became one of the key negotiators for the treaty. And afterwards he said, we must accept this. This is the stepping stone to achieve freedom. And the army, by and large, wanted to follow him. They said, what's good enough for Mick is good enough for us. But, as we'll see, there was a bitter civil war. And he, while setting out for his own town, of uh, his own county of Cork, uh, was shot at Bail And I think what you see there is that Collins really had no experience of fighting. Collins wasn't a military man, despite all of the mythology. So he had his rifle, and when his convoy was ambushed, he insisted of st on stopping to fight. He insisted on rushing out into the open and taking a few shots. And he was caught by a ricochet and died. And his death added a level of bitterness to the civil war because suddenly they had lost another leader. Suddenly the young hero, 32, had been taken from them and a lot of the bitterness of the civil war stemmed from that. Now Karl Brewer was also uh, a heroic figure in this period. He was the man who was wounded 22 times at least during the 1916 Rising. He was fighting at the South Dublin unit under Eamon Kant, and he held off advancing waves of British troops uh, with his German uh, Mauser pistol, uh, repeatedly firing, singing God Save Ireland in memory of the Manchester Martyrs. Afterwards, they were unable to take all the shrapnel out of his body, and the reason why he didn't end up in jail is they actually said, he'll never live, he'll die. And so he was paroled and released, and and he, he, he never was quite the same. Uh, he always, he was lame. Uh, he always suffered from the agony of this. He was a dour, the opposite of Collins. He was dour. He was secretive. Uh, he wasn't particularly sociable or particularly friendly. Unlike Collins, he didn't like to have drinks with the boys afterwards and tell them tall stories until late into the night. And during the War of Independence, he clung to his pet project. They should assassinate the British cabinet in London and never kind of accept him when people People said that was unrealistic. And he grew frustrated when the military men told him that his ideas were impractical and they didn't include him in their ideas, even though he was the Minister for Defence. And so when it came to the treaty, he refused to accept it. And in those heated debate debates afterwards, he denounced Collins, saying this was not the man who won the war. Actually, he only played a minor role in the War of Independence. Actually, he was only a junior figure. He doesn't deserve any of the reputation. And people were embarrassed. People said, Bruja, everyone knows you're wrong. This has made you look very foolish. This has made you look ridiculous. And uh, his belief was that the Irish doll could not commit national suicide by agreeing to this uh, surrender, the surrender of the Irish Republic, which they believed had been created in 1916. Uh, he dismissed uh, Collins as his subordinate, a subordinate in the Department of Defence. And then he accused Griffith and Collins of being weak men. He said the British chose them carefully. They knew the kind of men they were dealing with, men they could bend to their will and his reputation fell considerably. And even those who were against the treaty thought that he was smearing the name of a man, Collins, who had done everything he could to bring about uh, the ultimate victory. So when the Civil War broke out, when the Four Courts was taken by Rory O'Connor, Cahill Brewer knew that this time he would fight, just as in 1916, but this time there would be no question of surviving. He was determined to die. He went with reinforcements to try and relieve the four courts, holed up in the Gresham Hotel on Dublin's O'Connell Street, and from there uh, led a sortie into the nearby street, the street that bears his name, Cahill Brewer Street. And when the Free State forces began to converge around, he deliberately decided to run to his death. He deliberately went out into the open so that they would shoot him down. Because unlike in 1916, this time he did not want to survive. This time he did not want to carry on. And so he ran out into a hail of gunfire and, and went to his death. This time uh, getting the death that had eluded him in 1916. 
And Collins and Brew, I think, provide a very interesting perspective on this revolutionary period. How people uh, fell out amongst each other, but also how the bitterness and enmity that was created by some of these tensions exploded when the treaty was signed in December 1921. So as we decide to look at the 1916 Rising and then look at this revolutionary period, we must remember how it wasn't just one united force altogether. That as this conflict developed, the men and women who fought in it brought with it their own hopes, their own fears, their own dreams, their own beliefs, as they set about to win the Irish Republic.